God gave us his son, his most valuable and priceless gift of all.
show us a way that is humble and that seeks the good of others. We confess that we go our own way. We elevate ourselves and ignore the needs of others. Free us from the temptation to pursue our own pleasure only. Help us to live in harmony with all your people, sharing one world and eating around one table for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. May we bow for a silent prayer of confession. With abundant grace and mercy that reaches wide, God gathers us and cleanses us, making us new, making us whole. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may be seated. The reading this morning is Luke 14, 7 through 14. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come to you and say, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, sisters, relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This time, I'd like to all on Team Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, today I wanted to remember something with you. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would mow the grass, and I thought, well, one day, one day I'll get to mow the grass. And I thought, you know, because that would be really fun. Because I would watch my dad mow the grass. I thought it was the adult thing to do. It would be really cool one day when I get to mow the grass. Well, when I got old enough to mow the grass, I mowed it a couple times and thought it was really neat. But then it became my responsibility. And when it became my responsibility, I didn't want to do it anymore. So uh, sometimes life is like that. We look forward to something. We... we uh, get to do it for the first time, it's exciting, but then it might become a responsibility for us. And the way our faith wants us to handle that is to do even the mundane responsibilities that we have uh, in life in a way that, with an attitude that brings honor to God. We, do every, we should do everything that we do with a heart that says we're gonna do our very best to honor God. With all of the responsibilities in our life, it depends on what's in our heart as far as whether we're doing it as an obligation with bitterness in our heart, you know, with the attitude that we don't want to do it, or we can do it uh, with the idea that doing that the best way that we can makes God pleased and honors God. And so we have to try to be on that side of all the things that we do. At, at, be it as excited as the very first time we tried. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that blessing that you bring to us, the enthusiasm of doing things for the first time. We ask, Lord, that you help us to bring that joy and that fulfillment to everything that we do, 
that we might uh, do the things that we do to serve you and to honor you in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. We always know God is present. Whether life is good or times are difficult, you can turn to him and he will lead you step by step. But I, you notice I've met, read only a portion of that. 
And if you want to, later you can read the rest of what we are going to talk to, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. But I'm going to do my best to summarize the narrative so we can talk about the story as a whole without taking all the time it would take to read a chapter and a half. Now you may remember last week, we talked about how the Lord came to Abraham and encountered the Lord and two of his angels. Three men came to visit Abraham and Sarah, and Abraham, knowing that it was the Lord's presence before him, acknowledged himself before them as a servant and welcomed them in. And in that encounter, the Lord reassured Sarah and Abraham again that within one year they would have a child. Now, last week, we did not talk about the second part of chapter 18 and we have passed it by as part of our scripture uh, reading for today but I'm going to summarize because it's an important part of the whole story the Lord's visit had two purposes to, to uh, reassure Abraham and Sarah in the face of their doubts about the promise of their child and their heir but the second purpose of the Lord's visit was to see the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, to see if it was bad as the outcry that had been heard in heaven, that had reached the ears of the Lord. So the next day, after the Lord's visit to Abraham and Sarah, the Lord's angels prepare to head to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's something interesting about this conversation that they had between the two angels. The two angels were sitting there and pondering, well, should we tell Abraham where we're going? And they just and what we're going to do, what our purpose for the next part of our visit is? The answer turned out to be yes. And so they told Abraham what they were going to do. The Lord said the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah was so great and their sin so grievous that we're going to go down and see if they have done what, if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached the Lord's ears. If not, I will know, said the Lord. Now, in this instance, this visit, the purpose of this visit, I believe, is to give a sinful nation one last chance to give a righteous account for themselves. So the angels, the Lord's presence, got ready to be off towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham remained in the presence of the Lord. And so he tries to intercede, because remember, Lot is in Sodom, and that is his family. He tries to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. Perhaps he's concerned about Lot, who lives there. You remember that Lot and Abraham parted ways. Lot chose to go to the east, and, and ever since he has lived in or near Sodom. So Abraham, trying to intercede, says, if there are 50 righteous men in Sodom, will you spare the city? And God says, yes, absolutely. I will spare the whole city if I find 50 righteous men. So then Abraham says, okay, how about 45? And the Lord says, yes, I will uh, redeem the city at 45. And then Abraham kind of goes through this negotiation all the way down to 10 people. If there are 10 righteous men in Sodom, Will you spare the city? And the answer was yes. But it's interesting. It seems that Abraham is concerned about his nephew Lot, but he never really asks the Lord, will you save my nephew? Perhaps he just at this point figures, well, there's got to be 10 righteous people in Sodom. And so, my guess is that betting there was going to be ten righteous people, his goal had been fulfilled to intercede for his nephew. Well, the Lord did not find ten righteous 
men in Sodom. It seems that Sodom and Gomorrah were even worse than the outcry that reached the ears of the Lord had indicated. Okay, at this point I want to take a step back and think about the comparison between Abraham and Lot. They both encountered the Lord. They both encountered the same presence of the Lord. And they both welcomed the Lord into their home and showed as much hospitality as they could. They both identified themselves as the Lord's servants, servants and treated the Lord with due hospitality. And both in the end actually were judged as righteous. Lot, in fact, was apparently the old one in Sodom. Remember, Abraham and Lot parted way a long time ago only because the land would not support them both. Abraham, remember, said, you go left, I'll go right. And they parted ways. And we know that Lot chose the lush green area around Sodom. And we know also that, so that Lot started out pitching his tent near Sodom when he knew there was wickedness there. And then later we hear that he not only was next to Sodom, he was in Sodom. He was one of Sodom's residents who was taken away when Abraham had to rescue Lot in an earlier chapter. And now, he is a resident of Sodom. And in the first verse of chapter 19, we find him sitting in the gateway of the city. Now, you don't sit in the gateway of the city unless you have a leadership role in the city. So, as we compare Abraham and Lot, Abraham is a man of faith. In fact, the father of our faith. And it seems that Lot is a man of compromise. Many years ago, Lot moved to a land that he knew was filled with wickedness. He pitched his tent near that wickedness. Later, his life and his family were swept away by that wickedness, escaping only because Abraham rescued his family. At that point, Lot didn't choose to move away from that wickedness, but he chose, in fact, to draw nearer to that wickedness, to the point where in this passage we shared, he had to shield the world that he was living in from the eyes of the Lord. He had to go outside and say, don't show the Lord this wickedness. He pleaded with his neighbors not to reveal what was in their wicked hearts to the Lord. And from here, in the balance of chapter 19, there's a whole series of events that happen quite quickly. The angels decide that the whole area of Sodom and Gomorrah are irredeemable, and they will have to be destroyed. So, the angel says, is there anyone to Lot? Is there anyone that belongs to you? I will spare them. So Lot goes and pleads with the future husbands of his daughters. Come, come with me so that you can be spared. But the sons-in-law think he's just joking, crazy. So they go on about their way. The angels urge the rest of them, go to the mountains over there and protect yourself and don't look back. And this is a very important piece of advice as Lot's wife will find out. The angels have to get pretty firm with Lot and with his wife and daughters. Go now, go away, hurry, or I'll not be able to spare you. And then Lot has the nerve to say, how about not in the mountains? It's not very nice up there. How about if we go to this little town called Zor? Well, now the angel has to be just rolling his eyes. 
Okay, 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 just go. Or you're going to be destroyed with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So they go to Zor. And they settle there for a short time. And Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. They're burned to the ground. All people are killed instantly. And then Lot's wife looks back from Zor and she becomes a pillar of salt. So Lot and his daughters become nervous in Zor. Maybe they will come to know the same fate as Lot's wife. So they decide it wasn't such a bad idea to go to the mountains where they had originally been instructed to go by the angels. And Lot and his daughters settle there in a damp and barren and dark cave. And then, living in this setting for a long time, with no others in their community spared. Lot's daughters decide that if they're going to continue the family line, we must get our father drunk and come to know him so that the seed will come from the ashes of this judgment that has come upon our community. So, they both become pregnant and bear sons. And the sons are named Moab and Benami. Lot lived a life of compromise. We can see this story. Lot living a life of compromise. And when he lived a life of compromise long enough, that compromise, what, became normal. If you live a life of compromise long enough, the things that you know are wrong begin to find some kind of biblical justification. Or at the very least, maybe we don't feel like we have the strength or the courage or the power to bring about the change that would honor God. And so, living a life of compromise would grow to accept things that are contrary to the way of righteousness. Lot, sadly, has gone down the road of compromise in this passage and in this story. Where did this road lead him in the end? Remember, the reason that Lot and Abraham first Separated is because they both had too much stuff. They had too much wealth. They had too many cattle for the land to support them. They had so many people that there wasn't enough water and food to support them. So from there, there's three people left in a cave, desperate. All of the wealth and power are gone. The green plants that drew them to the land to the east, their ashes. His wife is a pillar of salt. His daughter's fiancés are burned to a crisp because they did not believe, because they were a part of the life of compromise. His daughters used the way of compromise that they had learned to take advantage of Lot for their own selfish purposes. Their sons, born from this sinful life of compromise, were the seed of the Moabites and the Am Ammonites, both tribes who were forever enemies of the Israelite nation, God's chosen people, enemies of the nation of Abraham, Lot's kin, separate from the family of God's chosen people, the family of their origin. Lot lived a life of compromise. Abraham 
lived a life of faith. Not perfect. There were doubts. But when Abraham makes a mistake, it's because he wants God's will so badly that his impatience forces errors in his faith. But his mistakes show him trying to further God's purpose. Lot's life of compromise is a life growing away from the righteousness of God in pursuit of matters of the world, in pursuit of what's greener over there, in pursuit of matters of the self. So the question proceeding from this lesson seems obvious. <clears throat> Are you living a life in pursuit of faith, like Abraham, or a life of compromise, like Lot? The answer for all of us is yes, and yes, we are living a life of faith and compromise. So the next question is a question we should all ask ourselves. How can I be more like Abraham and less like Lot? And the answer, simple to have in our mind, hard to live out, I guess. Trust and surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the nurture of your love, the guidance of your spirit directing our path. We ask, Lord, that you would empower us as we hear this story. Help us to choose our faith and to recognize the places of compromise so that we might grow with each day that passes. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We come now to the place where we prepare our hearts for the time that we spend in prayer. A couple of things that I want to call to your attention today. We want to keep Terry Vincent in our prayers who uh, had a fall earlier this week and broke his nose. And so we're going to keep him in your prayers. We also want to keep uh, Barbara Anderson in our prayers. Uh, she also fell and broke her hip, had surgery, I believe, on Thursday, but is doing well. And uh, 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 she's, I believe, now in, a, in a, a, a place where she's undergoing rehabilitation. Uh, we also want to keep uh, the, the things that have been donated to Humility Homes, that they might be uh, uh, an expression of God's love to the people that receive those things all the people that are affected by uh, the violence in Ukraine and by the other uh, things in the world that interrupt lives, like poverty and homelessness and, and natural disasters. We want to keep all the folks affected by uh, trouble in life in our prayers. Joe Roberts, Joyce King, Martha Green, Robert DeBreeze, Clint Dykoff, Gary Lovestead, Dylan Preston, Vicki Blair, uh, Jackie Brown, Julie Shutt, and Penny Peterson, and Kenny White, and those that are shut in, Alex uh, Strangard, <coughs> uh, and uh, Eleanor Garrison. Are there others that uh, need to be in our prayers as we prepare? Ellen? Um, I've read about the um, people in Myanmar who are refugees in other countries, and I have friends from Myanmar growing up. So prayers for them. Refugees? Yeah, they're going to other countries because Myanmar are the peace <coughs> and genocide and all these things happen. So there's a lot of refugees there and also from your Ukraine. So and, and I have friends who came from Myanmar, they came to Malaysia and then they came to the United States. So it's been um, a lot of genocide goes on. If, they don't, if you don't believe the way the Chinese government, because there will be plenty of the Myanmar stuff going on. So, so I want to keep. Uh, Refugees from Myanmar and uh, uh, Ukraine, all refugees. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Any others? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would direct our path as we bow our heads today, that uh, these uh, folks who have been mentioned might be cared for by your grace and mercy, and the folks that we maybe hadn't mentioned might be cared for and held up as well. We ask, Lord, that you would be with the refugees uh, from Myanmar and from Ukraine and all over uh, the world where there are places where genocide is happening. We ask that you just uh, give courage to those who flee. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with Terry Vincent as he recovers from the fall that he took. Just uh, be with him and, and with Mary as they seek to move past this difficult situation. We ask that you be with Barbara Anderson as she recovers from her fall and goes through the rehabilitation. We pray that you will empower her to do the therapy and be able to return to her apartment. We ask, Lord, that you be with the gifts that will go this week to community homes and the gifts that have already gone, that they might be an expression of God's love and that they might fulfill the purpose you had in store for each one. We ask that you'd be with uh, Joe Roberts as he continues to go through treatments and has good weeks and bad weeks, but uh, you continue to sustain him and we praise him for that. We ask that you'd be with Joyce King and Martha Green. Martha Green continues to go through cancer treatments. We ask that you'd help her to find peace. Uh, we ask that you just care for Joyce and help her to find uh, joy with each day. 
We ask that you be with Robert DeVries and Clint Dykoff and Gary Lovestead and Dylan Preston, that their situation might be held in your home and that they might know joy in spite of whatever difficulties are present before them. We ask that you care for Vicki Blair and Jackie Brown, Julie Shutt, just care for the needs of these your children. Help them to understand that Christ is by their side no matter what direction and what turns their lives take. We ask that you be with uh, Patty Peterson. We praise you that for her, uh, the, the treatments have done pretty well. And we ask that you uh, be with Kenny White as he uh, suffers from lung cancer. Just uh, care for him. We ask that you be with all of those folks shut in and not able to be uh, where they would get out the way they would like to. We ask that you be with Eleanor and, and with Barbara and with uh, Joyce and with Alex and, and uh, others who just can't get out, maybe Sue and Bob, that can't get out the way they would like to. Just care for them and help them to know that they are an important part of the ministry of this congregation. Be in our world, be in our country, be in our world that uh, we might live as your people this day and in every day that we encounter the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray now the prayer our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the place where we dedicate the offering that comes before us this week. Thank you. 